Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to come to speak at this Congress at this special time around White Nights. So the topic of my talk is molecular markers in advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancers. What is standard care and what are the perspective? Um, I, myself, I'm a pathologist and a cytopathologist working, working at the University Hospital Basel and um, thoracic pathology is one of my main interests and we are seeing uh, lung cancer specimens every day and we are much involved in the predictive marker diagnostics as well. It's okay, but there should be the projection somehow. I see it on that screen. Oh, now it's good. So, that's starting again. So, that's the agenda of this talk. First, I will talk on the state of the art, which you know is very clear nowadays. It's a predictive marker analysis for EGFR mutation and ALK rearrangement. And then we will talk about emerging biomarkers and new technologies that uh, are arising. One is certainly next generation sequencing and the related gene panels that have become commercially available. Then we will touch upon liquid biopsy and I cannot conclude such a talk without uh, also briefly speaking about the immune checkpoint from a pathology point of view. So this is the current landscape of molecular subtyping of non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer. When we talk about non-squamous we mean adenocarcinomas and non-small cell carcinomas that have an immunohistochemical phenotype of um, adenocarcinoma. I won't talk about the stratification because this is now a total standard. We know in pathology how to tell you whether it's adenocarcinoma or squamous or NSCLC, NOS. Uh, so this is uh, actually, initially we start by selecting non-squamous uh, carcinoma, adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma phenotype and then we go for substratification. And uh, as you can see uh, from this summary, uh, like um, in one third of the cases we still don't know the molecular driver of these carcinomas. In almost two thirds of the cases there is a specified molecular driver which often serves as a therapeutic target as well. Unfortunately, the large, largest proportion is made by KRAS mutations. As you know, there is not yet a specific drug against these mutated cancers. This is different with EGFR sensitizing mutations which make 10 to 16, 17 percent in Europe and the ALK rearrangement that makes 7%. So this is the main target of the discussion. This is the standard of care. And there are a lot of small prevalence molecular alterations, some of which has become very interesting as therapeutic targets, even though they are only affect a small proportion of patients. If the patient is affected, it may make a great difference. One of these is MET, where we have drugs. Her two maybe may play a role in lung cancer. ROSE 1 has become very important. We will talk about it. BRAF, RET, and so on. You see many targets, many drugs. Not many of these have been approved, but it's rapidly evolving. This is the field in Switzerland, the recommendation by the Swiss Lung Pathology Group, um, and in collaboration with medical oncologists. So that's how we deal with it in Switzerland from a point of view of algorithm. So we first define the subtype, adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma phenotype, and in case we are dealing with the advanced stage, at least 3B, or mostly uh, stage 4 metastatic, we go automatically, or after discussion with the oncologist, to mutation analysis, uh, which always includes EGFR, EGFR, but we also propose to test for more because we have the technology to do it. So we always test KRAS, HER2 and BRAF and we report the results as well. Nowadays we do it mostly with uh, NGS panels. At the same time, in order not to lose time, we initiate immunohistochemistry for ALK uh, IHC and ROS IHC for the reason that if it's positive and that may be true in is in less than 10%, let's say 7, 8% of the patients, then we know it the other day and can proceed with confirmation and the patient can get treated. We don't have to wait for the result of the mutation analysis, which always takes five to seven working days. 
So if this is negative, uh, we have to wait these five days. And if that's, this has been negative or positive, we confirm it by fish. Then uh, we also confirm ROS1 by fish if needed, if we have the immunohistochemistry negative or positive. And uh, if everything is negative so far, uh, our oncologists agreed that we proceed with RET analysis. And uh, depending on the situation, mm -hmm. there is also an option to do additional analysis. So it's getting quite complicated from our perspective, but it's, it has become a standard. Um, it's challenging to deal with all of these analyses because the material that we have is often limited, as you know. Very often it's small biopsies, transbronchial or transthoracic biopsies. We also have cytological specimen. That's an example of an effusion. We also prepare cell blocks from these cytological specimens. So that's uh, also written in many guidelines now that um, the management of tumor material for molecular testing requires that we consider everything we have, have. So you cannot say, I only look at biopsies, someone else looks at, at cytology. It should be the same person looking at everything and ma managing prioritizes the mater material for the different analyses that have to be done. In that respect, we also do upfront empty sections in uh, biopsies from patients where, is a, where there is a suspicion of lung cancer. So we don't lose time. If we have lung cancer here, we can immediately proceed to IHC or FISH testing on the, on the uh, prepared empty sections. There are also pre-analytical requirements that's also emphasized in many um, guidelines and recommendations, you should really do it in a standardized way. Fix the tissue in 10% buffered formalin and in nothing else. And the fixation time should, should also be within a frame. It shouldn't be less than six hours. It shouldn't be more than, let's say, three days. Otherwise, uh, it negatively affects the result of the technique. As I said, we also and often use cytological specimen. So there is no um, competition between So these are examples of cytological specimens. Very often we do only have cytological specimens without concurrent IFC being available. So that's a case where we needed DNA for mutation testing. We had only one of these liquidized based cytology slides. So we just scrape off the tumor cells from one part of the area and retain the other one maybe for documentation, maybe for fish or IHC. So we can do different things on one slide. And every patient is totally different. We always have to evaluate the individual situation. Here we had two slides, cytological slides, hundreds, thousands of cells on a slide. Here we scratched off the tumor cells for NGS analysis. Here we reserve two areas for fish analysis, if needed, for rearrangement testing. And here we reserved one slide for a for NGS rearrangement panel, I'll get back to this a little bit later. So let's get back to the standard of care, which, as I said, is EGFR mutation testing and ALK testing. For EGFR testing, there are many different assays, possibilities to test for mutations. Um, all of these require a minimum number and proportion of cancer cells on a histological slide or a cytological slide. And very often we have to enrich, if we have a very low proportion of tumor, the DNA is diluted by normal DNA and we may miss the um, mutation. Therefore, tumor cell enrich enrichment is important. This can be done with a scalpel manually or we may also apply laser microdissection. I'll show you an example. Um, for ALK analysis, okay. For ALK analysis, um, uh, the standard has been uh, fish fluorescence in cytohybridization, and these must be experienced operators doing it and experienced pathologists having a good understanding of how to interpret the data. More lately, IHC, immunohistochemistry, has come into the game, and it's another technology, as I showed you in the algorithm. There is also RT-PCR on the NGS, which you will see. Well, whatever you do, it's very important for pathologists to validate your own technology in external quality assessment. There are international regular ring, ring trials where we have to take part. 
and pass the exam, so to say. And also something that, uh, that's important for the oncologist, we have to deliver the results usually in five to 10 working days. The other markers, I alluded to them already quickly. There are many other markers. We feel that KRAS, although it's not a predictive marker yet, it's interesting to have the information because it makes a large fraction of all drivers. And if we find a KRAS mutation, we don't have to look for another driver because it's usually mutually exclusive. If you have KRAS, you have nothing else. So it's done and it's not a very good information for the patient, but we don't have to seek for anything else. And uh, for the less common molecular markers, predictive markers, we often discuss with our local oncologists how to proceed, uh, proceed in the individual patients. We have several key techniques, techniques for predictive mark analysis. One is clearly mutation analysis. It's the most important because the mutations are the most important predictive markers in lung cancer. Then the next is fluorescence and cytohybridization, the traditional method to diagnose gene fusions or rearrangements like ALK and ROS1. And then the technique of immunohistochemistry is growing because it's so easy, it's universally available in all labs and in some conditions you can um, determine the status of a predictive marker by IHC alone. RT-PCR is less commonly used and it is not really in the focus right now. Let's go uh, to the first and currently still most important mutations that we are looking for, that's, that's the EGFR mutations. That's quite an old paper. It was, the mutation was first discovered uh, as a clinical target like in 2005, that's when we started the analysis and um, shortly thereafter uh, this ca paper came out where all the possible mutations that we can detect are listed and they span over across four exons of the EGFR, EGFR and the most common ones as you know are the exon 19 deletions, uh, all different ones and the second most common exon 21 and they are uh, they sensitize the tumors to the EGFR inhibitors and they are also, they are not only sensitizing mutation but also resistance mutations uh, which are commonly found in uh, exon 20. So this is what we are actually looking for. We started with Sanger sequencing initially and now as I said we do it um, with uh, next generation sequencing. So this is not something to look at under the microscope, but, but we have to make sure that we extract DNA from cytological or antihistological material and provide it to the molecular lab. These are quite unchallenging, easy cases to deal with. Uh, that's a transbronchial biopsy. You see still the alveolar lung tissue. You see the solid tumor tissue in here. And that, that's actually the tumor area that we have. So in such a case, we want to enrich. We want to get rid of the normal lung tissue and purify the tumor cells for DNA extraction. That can be easily done just by a magnifying glass and a scalpel where, it, where we just scratch off tumor cells and uh, put it into a tube for DNA extraction. That's a transbronchial fine needle aspirate. It shows almost purely tumor cells and that's an easy one as well. We just scratch off these stained cells uh, from the slide for DNA extraction. Most cases are like this, are not so challenging. However, in 20% it gets more challenging we, because we have a smaller proportion of tumor cells. That's such a typical bronchial or transbronchial biopsy. You have a lot of inflammatory changes here, a lot of stromal tissue, and you have few areas like here where the, there are tumor infiltrates here and here, and may, maybe here. If you just take the whole material, extract the DNA, you can easily miss the mutations be because you have much more normal DNA than tumor DNA. That's the case. Um, in such a case, we use laser microdissection under a laser-guided microscope. Oh, it's getting slow, or not at all. Oh, yes. So we mark the lesion here under the microscope. Somehow. Oh. And that's the result after laser microdissection. So these cells have been excised by the laser and catapulted into a tube that goes automatically under the microscope. Um, and we have a, 
let's say, usually 80% um, fraction of tumor cells, pure tumor cell DNA, and that's very well suitable for the analysis. This is also applicable for cytology. You have a group of uh, adenocarcinoma cells by cytology, normal cells around here, and we just apply it and we we collect it, harvest it for DNA extraction. That's common practice, at least in our lab. We have been doing this for 10 years now. It's working well. So from a technical point of view, there has uh, been a lot of progress in the last two years, I would say, when these benchtop sequencers have become available. These are um, affordable machines, about of this size, like that. You can put it on a normal desk in the lab, and we use them uh, for panel testing using uh, next generation sequencing. For the purpose of time, I can't uh, really go into the details of the techniques of next generation sequencing. Fact is, you enter tumor DNA into the machine and there is a massively parallel automatic sequencing um, process with a lot of data that's generated and uh, it's analyzed by the computer. We can look at like 50 or even more uh, genes at a time and at a very high sensitivity. That's the main message. And importantly, we can also use our routine material, cytological specimens or paraffin embedded small biopsies. So this works in 90% of all biopsies in our labs, at least 90%. Uh, we need a uh, little DNA, that's uh, what we get from small biopsies usually, 10 nanograms. We usually need two to 200 to 300 tumor cells, which is not a lot. And the tumor cell content, percentage of tumor cell in a specimen, needs to be um, at least, at not less than, no, it should be at least 20% uh, 20 tumor cells. Just to give you an idea about number of tumor cells, if you look at this group, that's from a bronchial brush or, or transbronchial FNA, I don't know. Anyway, that's a whole sheet of tumor cells. It's adenocarcinoma. Here we have normal cells lying around. So we, I counted them yesterday night. It's approximately 150 cells. You can do DNA analysis, everything you want with this uh, area of tumor cells. If you have twice as much, even better, but we can do it with that, all gene analysis that you wish to have. So it's really, that explains uh, that we can do all these analysis in clearly more than 90% of the patients that need the analysis. That's one of these gene panels that are commercially available and they are constantly being changed and updated as well. That's the so-called cancer. Uh, panel of a company. It targets 50 genes and the only one that we really need here is EGFR and it's broadly covered but it also contains other interesting candidates which you receive without extra effort. That's a nice thing. So we have BRAF mutation, ALK mutation, we have KRAS mutation, PI3K, that's HER2, ERTB2. These are all Genes, if you find the mutations, it can make a difference to the patients. He may get the drug or he may get entered into a clinical trial. Uh, so it's a very moving field with these targeted genes. So there are many emerging targeted agents and respective genetic alteration. And that's an updated um, NCCN guideline version. I, I downloaded this a few weeks ago. It's already a little bit outdated again. Uh, so we have uh, BRAF mutation, which um, there is a mutation with available drugs, not yet approved, but available. Uh, then we have high-level amplification, or um, that's the latest addition, met exon 4 skipping mutation. It's very rare, but these patients respond to this drug. Red rearrangement, rose 1 rearrangement, her two mutations. So if you find those, you enter the patient, you may enter the patient into a clinical trial, especially when it's a young patient, or there are compassionate use programs where the patients obtain the drug. So that's outdated already. It's not emerging. In the meantime, it has been approved, at least in the US by the FDA. If a patient has this rearrangement, they will get the treatment. And it's also so in Switzerland, if a patient has this treatment, it's not yet approved in Switzerland, but the drug is available and there are compassionate use programs in place. So let's go to the second um, 
um, standard of care marker beside EGFR, it's ALK. So this is not about mutation testing. That's something different. That's uh, rearrangement testing. And this rearrangement is rare, but still at up to 7%. It's the same spectrum of patients, may mostly adenocarcinoma, light or never smoker, but not exclusively, and rather younger smoker. If you see a patient with like around 50 or so, non-smoker or not heavy smoker, there is a higher likelihood that they will have ALK or EGFR mutation. The response to the uh, respective drug, crisotimib, is very good, be better than immuno. Uh, chemotherapy, it's 60%. And in the meantime, it has been approved as a first-line and second-line treatment. I, know, I don't know how the situation is in Russia, but in Europe, in general, it's approved, not in every country, but in Europe, it's approved first and second line because of the very convincing data that are around. <coughs> Now that I uh, just want to briefly explain you uh, how we have to deal with this marker. This has been the approved assay initially, standard marker that was obligatory to apply. Uh, it's the fluorescence in situ hybridization. So that's the stretch of the chromosome. Here is the ALK gene. And in case of ALK rearrangement, there is a break, break of the chromosome. And this chromosome um, flips then after the break by 180 degree and this end with the EML4 egg gets close, fuses with ALK and this makes, uh, leads to a constant overexpression of ALK, constitutive activity of ALK. Now the um, manufacturer of this fish assay they generated a probe with two parts, one probe is red and the other one is green and in a normal gene status, they are close together. You see them close together or overlying. If the break happens, they break apart because this, this one flips by 180 degrees to the other end. And we can see that under the microscope. In a less common situation, this one is deleted as well. And then we see, see only a single red and no corresponding green. It's actually quite easy from, from a theoretical point of view, but it's no, not always easy under the microscope. You see it here, that's one big tumor cells with many ALK genes. Tumor cells are not normal. They are often aneuploic, polysomic, have, have many copies of every chromosome. That's the case here. But you see they are very closely together. There is no evidence of a rearrangement. That's ALK negative, despite the high number of ALK genes in the cell. And um, I will next show you uh, ALK positive examples. That's the more common one. You have green ones that are is isolated and you have red ones that are isolated. So these two have broken and these two have broken. And we also have, in that case, four normal genes that are not rearranged within a cell. It's, only, it's not all of the alleles are rearranged. One is enough to make a difference. That's another case, a, a tumor cell with only two ALK genes, but one of them has the deletion. Uh, the green one got lost. Clear-cut case of positive cases. There is also a threshold that must be met. We need to see at, at least 15% of the cells having this pattern. It's a little bit um, difficult. It needs experience. It's not everywhere available. Therefore, it was um, quite an interesting and good development that fish, that immunohistochemistry become available. Once a cell has this rearrangement, it's always overexpressed. And uh, there are now immunohistochemistry assay. They work on histology and they work on cytology. And they are very much concordant with the fish results. So immunohistochemistry chemistry can therefore be used for screening patients for subsequent analysis of positive ones, or it may replace fish altogether because it's so highly concordant with immunohistochemistry. That's the most commonly proposed algorithm. It's not universal, but some labs proceed like this. If it's negative by immunohistochemistry, there is no treatment with the ALK inhibitor. If it's three plus strongly positives, as I showed you, the patient can go direct, can be directly go to chrysotinib therapy. If it's weak or heterogeneous, not so clear, then it can be confirmed by fish. Now, I mentioned the ROS1 already. It's actually the same story as with ALK. It's the same principle. It's another oncogene that is rearranged in a smaller fraction of the patients. It's only 2%. 
And it's also about this rearrangement. It's the same technique that we use, a row-specific fish probe, and it's actually also the same drug that is active in the rose rearranged tumors as in algae rearranged tumors. These are the uh, clinical studies you may be aware of. So there is a very high response rate of crisotinib in ROS1 rearranged lung cancer. It's usually between 70 and 80 percent, which is even better than uh, crisotinib in the ALK rearranged tumors. And for these reasons, it has just recently been approved, as I mentioned, by the FDA March 16, and it will probably soon be approved in, in Europe as well, because it's so obvious and the data are so clear. But only 2% of the patients, so we have to screen at least 50 patients, 50 biopsy in order to find one positive. For us, it's often, often a little bit frustrating, because we see only negative results, but it's also exciting if we see once in a while a positive result. And it's the same as with ALK. There is a fish test specific for ALK, again with this break apart and um, single signals that these are normal cells, um, or negative cells, or else positive cells. And there is also immunohistochemistry test that has a very high sensitivity. It works very well. So if you don't have fish in place, you can apply immunohistochemistry, <coughs> which is, of course, much easier. You see they are also diffusely positive, some uh, heterogeneity variability, but it's clearly detectable as a positive case. So as there are more and more rearrangement coming, you can imagine it gets complicated and we have limited material. So we cannot do mutation testing, uh, uh, three or four different uh, rearrangement by IHC, immunosecamistry, and FISH. Too much more work, too expensive, and too little material available. So that's um, uh, why such so-called fusion gene panels are being developed, have been developed, and this one is also commercial av available. It requires um, uh, extraction of RNA, from the tissue or cell specimens, and then it's a next generation gene panel approach, and with one reaction, we can test for four different rearrangements. We talked about ALK, ROS1, I mentioned RET, and there is another one which is very rare, but they also respond to a treatment. And this, uh, this is something which is now entering clinical practice. We have using, been using this now for a couple of months. So I want to also say a few words about the uh, clinically important topic of acquired resistance. With all of these targeted treatments, there's, uh, there's eventually, it's unavoidable that there will be a resistance after a certain time. And this has been um, well described for ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors and EGFR TKIs. With ALK TK, TKIs, it's actually new ALK mutations that um, confer resistance to the tumor cells or ALK unrelated emergence of other oncogenes. But we won't talk about ALK-TKI because it's not routinely being tested because there is no specified therapy in this situation of ALK, resi of ALK resistance yet, but it's, no, there is no, no predictive market. There is a treatment of ALK resistant disease, but it doesn't require market testing. That's different with EGFR. As you know, like more than half of all resistances in EGFR TK treated patients are caused by this exon 20 T790M mutation, and there is a highly active drug that works in patients with this uh, mutation, but not in patients with the uh, other resistance mechanisms. Now, how to deal with this? Ideally, we would do a rebiopsy of a progressing resistant lesion. That's not always easy in a meta metastatic patient. If you can have easy access, like a malignant diffusion, it can, of course, be done. And the other option, which is becoming more popular, are the liquid biopsy. In a met metastatic patient, there is tumor DNA floating in the blood, and if we can extract the tumor DNA, we can cover the whole tumor population volume uh, and test for this specific mutation. The methods that can be used are next generation sequencing, which is highly sensitive, or other techniques, it's called ARMS or digital PCR. Uh, that's the, um, the basics about liquid biopsy. This has been something futuristic in the past, but it's now really entering clinical practice. It's being done routinely. Um, so we, I, I will talk actually about 
circulating cell-free DNA. There are also the circulating tumor cells, which are now really not important right now. But um, the circulating cell-free DNA is important. So we have the tumor cells. The tumor cells die. They undergo apoptosis. And the tumor DNA goes into the blood and stays there for a couple of hours. Um, and we can collect the blood and extract the DNA. Of course, there is way more normal DNA in the blood than circulating tumor DNA. So it's the problem of the low prevalence of this DNA. That's why we need high sensitivity techniques. The analysis can be done usually with two times uh, 10 milliliter of blood plasma. Uh, we are doing this uh, and the application that is uh, most attractive nowadays is testing for T790M mutation in progressing patients under EGFR TKI. And that was actually the first patient the clinicians asked us to do the um, plasma DNA. Uh, the patient was diagnosed with an exon 19 uh, EGFR mutation, um, uh, diagnosed in a bronchoalveolar lavage. Then the patient received EGFR TKI. They had se she had severe side effects. So it was a change to chemotherapy. In, in the meantime, after 16 months, a biopsy had been taken. We did next generation sequencing. The EGFR mutation here in green was always was always there during the whole time of the disease, but there was emergence of a new KRAS mutation detected at this time point of the biopsy. The patient received chemotherapy, uh, received also nivolumab and recurred again. So she had resistant disease. At that time, we did the liquid biopsy. The KRAS mutation was not there any longer. It disappeared. Uh, under the treatment probably of chemotherapy, but the T790M mutation uh, occurred and it could be diagnosed in the liquid biopsy. There was also a P53 uh, mutation coming up which had no mutation. So as you can see, we can follow the gen genomic evolution of a, uh, of a tumor across time uh, doing repetitive mutation analysis. And that's one of the strengths in, um, um, in liquid biopsies as well. And this patient responded to the T790M specific drug, by the way. Uh, a last few words about cancer immunotherapy because it's important for us. It's a very primitive uh, cartoon. We have the tumor cells, we have the cytotoxic T cells. The cytotoxic T cells want to kill the tumor cells. These are the soldiers actually. This is the enemy. And the enemy protects itself with a shield with its PDL1 because PDL1 paralyzes paralyzes the cytotoxic T cells. And if we apply drugs against anti-PD-1 or PDL1, um, this, uh, this paralyzation is relieved. Cytotoxic T cells can become active. That's, that's the simple basics behind it. Of course, in reality, it's much more complex. But, but that's the rationale um, for the treatment. And as pathologists, we are now asked to test for PDL1 expression because it has been shown uh, two, uh, those cases where tumor cells or immune cells express PDL1 are the patients that have most profit of the treatment. So what can we do? There are antibodies, and that's a tumor that is strongly positive for PDL1. So these tumor cells may be protected against the attacks of the C T cells. These are normal alveolar macrophages. They also express it, and that's a totally negative tumor. There is also the fact that the tumor environment with antigen-presenting cells and macrophages, they may also express PDL1, and this has also some predictive value. So it's getting complex. We, have, we are dealing with tumor cells, and we are dealing with immune cells, and we need to test both of these compartments for expression. Now, it gets even more complicated for us. It's really a kind of a crisis, or at least a dilemma of predictive testing. Uh, five different companies have developed anti-PD-1 or PDL1 drugs, and some of them have already been, have, have, most of them have come on the market or will come on the market, and also the respective predictive market testings. So five drugs, five different predictive markers with five different antibodies on different immunostainer platforms. So this is an unbelievable, unbelievable complexity. Most of the, all of the studies or drugs consider positivity of tumor cells as a predictive marker and 
one company, that's actually the Roche compounds, they also importantly consider positivity or negativity of the immune cells. Four antibodies, two platforms, different cutoffs and different scoring systems. So that's um, uh, quite a uh, challenge. That's the, an example of the pembrolizumab drug, drug um, from um, uh, Merck. And uh, they have a particular DACO assay with a particular antibody and they just require from us to determine the tumor proportion core score. So it's not yet clear where the threshold will be at the time of approval, but it's probably at like the 50%. If 50% of the tumor cells are positive, the case is positive and the patient receives the drug. If not, the patient does not receive the drug. So we have to make this cut in our lab, which is not always so easy to tell whether something is now 40% or 50% or more. It's much more complicated with Roche. They consider both the TC tumor cell positivity rate and the immune cell positivity rate, and the tumor may be uh, PDL1 positive in T cell or tumor cell or in both together. There are different threshold thresholds for the immune cells and for the tumor cells. It's clear that a lot of training is required with pathologists to really understand the system and to apply it appropriately. This is work ongoing. Maybe by the end of the year there will be a solution available. This takes me to the summary. As you have seen, biomarker analysis in lung cancer is a rapidly evolving field. There are many new challenges in tissue management, prioritization, enrichment, and so on. And there are continuously new technologies coming. The latest one are NGS and liquid biopsies. And uh, what is also clear, there is a very strong need for interdisciplinary collaboration with pulmonologists, with uh, medical oncologists, pathologists, and molecular biologists. Thank you. Thank you. If you agree, we will have the discussion after the next presentation. Thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Thank you again for a very interesting.